have here uh, Joe and Fanny from uh, Research for Action, which is a research and campaigning organization that also has links that they can probably explain here with Debt Resist UK. Um, and what I know about Debt Resist UK and Research for Action best in relation to is their work around uh, local authority borrowing council debt, particularly um, logo loans or lender option borrow option loans. Um, Joel, Fanny and Vika, who's also here, have been really instrumental in campaigning to get logos recognised as a problem, as well as in initiating recent legal action and some write-downs, um, or at least sort of new payment schedules. Um, and I'm sure they'll talk about it more, but these are loans that allow the lender, usually Barclays or RBS, uh, to increase the interest rate at periods if they choose, that's their option. The borrower's option is to accept the new rate or repay the amount in full, which when you have a 60 year local authority loan is sometimes quite difficult to do. Um, so um, this is something that, in the, the bizarreness of the local situation is captured in the prudential guidance from the uh, one of the, uh, is it for a regulator? Or? Yeah, it's not a pseudo regulator. Pseudo regulator. Policy, policy who describes logos as inherently risky, but since the risk is only activated when the lender triggers the option to increase the interest rate, they're not actually risky. <laughs> Which is, is utterly bizarre, and I've tried a little bit to uh, get involved in one of the many fantastic things they do, which is organise a citizen of debt audits. Uh, which is an important way of encouraging people to do kind of forensic investigations into local finance to understand indebtedness and the relationship between local project debt and austerity. Uh, but it's also important because under the Cameron government we lost the, the, the government audit office that, that sort of automatically looked at council's books and discovered the last big uh, chaotic speculative uh, movement by British councils in, in the 80s. So that's what uh, Joel and Fanny did, among many other things. And also uh, here, Fanny Herogan, who is a brilliant, brilliant artist uh, based in, in the Netherlands, who I frequently use her work to teach with, because Fanny has made fantastic serious games uh, like Taxidus, which involve putting in a lot of information about tax treaties, and you can take on the persona of one of the big four accountants working for a large multinational and your mission in the game is to minimise your tax obligations by structuring yourself cleverly in this virtual world. And liquid citizenship, which I've also enjoyed teaching with, where you are randomly assigned a citizenship and a net wealth, and that determines where you can go, what residence you can get elsewhere. Um, looking at your know, citizenship for sale, um, residency, uh, investments, based passports and so on. And Fenka's other work has also involved, I mean, the amount of work that goes into it, I don't entirely understand how Fenka is one person, but things like the all infrared line, looking at the landing points of past and historical undersea cables, um, sort of sometimes banal, sometimes heavily securitized sites where these cables that have been instrumental to creating transatlantic and globalized finance actually come to land. Um, and Geographies of avoidance, one of the most interesting ones is kind of like a phone book for shell companies <laughs> that was created uh, when she was an artist in resident in, in, in Amsterdam. I think the first time we met, you mentioned how analysts started wanting to buy copies of it as a, as, as a sort of... And then used it all for us as well. Yeah. But it's public information. Yeah. So, so she, she did all the work and now... <laughs> Now I was using it. And then recent project in Triangular Trade, looking at the parallels between um, the making of new resource frontiers uh, driven by interest in renewable energy, so the demand for things like lithium because of battery metals, which is triggering new cycles of investment frontier making in the DLC that echo in many ways older practices of investment frontier making in the DLC. So um, a really exciting panel with two or three people, an organisation and a person, who do quite different work, but tied together by a sort of investigative 
ethos in some ways. There's an artist that possibly Funk has worked with, Paolo Chirio, who's written an essay about evidentiary, evidentiary realism and kind of putting art to work in the service of forensic investigation when we're looking for connections that aren't always immediately visible. Right? Finding the ways that uh, finance reliefs across space and across time manifest themselves isn't always possible through all these various procedures, although sometimes Louise Blomick is talking about how she's a realist of sorts, it does work. Um, but I guess that might be one of the threads that ties them together. Um, and I'll stop talking now and hand over to, I think, are we going to do Joel, Danny, Ben? Yeah. If Joel is ready, because I can hold my call first, if it still takes you a while to. Perfect. Thanks for the introduction, Paul. Um, so, today myself and Fanny will be taking this into two parts. So, we'll be giving a, a walkthrough on our investigative research on logo loans and financialization municipalities. Uh, but first, I'm going to be speaking a little about historical context in one of the banks um, primarily involved in this market, which is um, RBS or the World Bank of Scotland. Um, so, RBS emerged in the 17th century. Um, from the ashes of Scottish imperial ambition. So for those who don't know it, there was a um, attempt to colonise a part of the Panama coast called the Dari in the 17th century. Um, prior to this, in 1632, um, Scotland had lost their only colony at the time in Nova Scotia as a result of the English war against France. The English war with the Dutch subsequently compromised trading privileges for Scottish merchants which I previously relied upon, which meant the opportunity for Scotland for commerce had been shrunk. They were looking for new opportunities elsewhere. And so the Company of Scotland was established um, to attempt to trade with Africa and the Indies. This was the idea of a man called William Patterson, who was a prolific projector or promoter of speculative money-making activities. And, um, this is Patterson here. So, a key part of Patterson's plan was to establish a Scottish colony in Central America in the Darien, which is again now part of Panama. So that merchant ships could reach the Pacific more easily without having to make a long, arduous journey around Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope. Public bodies, town corporations, member of parliament, the landed gentry, and thousands of citizens, sea captains and surgeons, sank their life savings into the scheme with a quarter to one and a half of Scotland's surplus wealth at the time invested in the Darien. Nine months after the 3,000 colonists set out for Panama in 1698, aboard ships from names including the Unicorn, Caledonia and Endeavour, two-thirds of the settlers were dead due to disease and illness in the damp tropical jungle. And so sort of a map here of um, the Darien and New Edinburgh, situating that between Panama and Colombia. Um, as well as suffering attacks from the Spanish, um, King William of England ordered the English colonies of North Africa and the Caribbean not to trade with Caledonian settlements of Darien, which would be in direct competition with the East India Trading Corporation. The empirical misadventure of Darien was bankrupt in Scotland, which shortly thereafter was forced to accept the Union of England and the sacrifice of its own parliament as part of the Union deal. Scotland accepted compensation not as the equivalent for the price of Scotland at the time. Scotland gave up its sovereignty for the price of English bailout <coughs> of the Darien investors. Scottish poet Robbie Burns was scathing the Scottish Parliament that voted to accept the Union of England. We bought and sold for English gold such parcels of rogues and nations, bro. Flush with English cash, the equivalent company argued for the formation of the Royal Bank of Scotland which was approved by the Whig Prime Minister Robert Walpole under Royal Charter in 1727. The creation of RBS was supported by English elites at the time because a Scottish competitor, the Bank of Scotland, was known to be sympathetic to the Jacobites. And thus began a centuries of old turf war between RBS and the Bank of Scotland. By the mid-2000s, RBS had won the war of attrition with the old bank, and rather than Scotland chasing empire, this time it was the Royal Bank of Scotland, the 
becoming the largest bank in the world by assets, following the ill-fated merger with AB and Emera. Um, so this, this was uh, a deal done in 2007, just before the, the financial crisis, and when you kind of unpick the deal, this works, it's quite interesting thinking about the historic and political context of RBS's plan to merge with ABM. So, in essence, you had the um, ABM Emro, which was the empirical financial vehicle um, for expansion and colonialism of the Dutch, being taken over by RBS, which is the equivalent for uh, Scotland. And RBS at the time was um, completely addicted to a growth rule cost strategy. Um, the CEO at the time, Fred Goodwin, was out um, you know, looking at the big kind of emerging tech companies today, like Google. Here we have a photograph of the RBS headquarters in Edinburgh, which was modeled on um, Google's campus. So, very much kind of situated this idea of Scotland again being kind of a world leader in this all conquering Scottish company. Um, so, a year later, when RBS failed um, during the 2008 financial crisis, um, a lot of people don't realise that, again, it was the largest bank in the world at the time. So we think of um, the financial crisis through things like um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Um, we don't necessarily think about the role of UK institutions in the 2008 crash as much as we perhaps should. So in this um, graphic here, we've got um, basically kind of it's a series of metrics on which sort of banks are scored for the events that failed during the 2008 crash. So we have low capital, merger and acquisition, um, bad investments and trading, uh, bad lending, and risky funding structure. And if you look at this, RBS is situated slap bang in the middle because all on all of these metrics is basically the worst bunch. Um, this gives you some idea of just how RBS was kind of run in the sort of lead up to the financial crisis. Um, our work and our research in particular is sort of focused on what's happened to RBS and particularly RBS's effect on the UK economy after the financial crisis. Um, there's been a lot written about this by people like Ian Martin and Ian Fraser, um, how essentially you know, RBS and the bailouts of RBS, the austerity which has followed, has in effect kind of bankrupted Britain and imposed a, a loss of democracy and a loss of public institutions on British society in a similar vein to what was inflicted on the Scots after the, the Darien collapse in the 17th century. So, I guess there's a, there's a couple of ways in which um, this has sort of played out since 2008. So, RBS and global empire has shrunk considerably since. Um, we've seen <coughs> increasing financial regulation, which has kind of forced these banks to somewhat retreat from international markets, um, sort of shrink their um, international trading activities. And so what that's forced the, the banks to do is focus more um, on their internal markets, on the UK economy. So our work in particular is focused on um, these local, local authorities, which we'll hand over the Fannie to talk about. And just give one more example um, in what has been described as the largest debt anywhere ever. Um, one of the latest scandals to engulf RBS is what's known as the Global Restructuring Group, GRG scandal, where essentially they <coughs> had created a, what they called intensive care unit for struggling businesses and were instead kind of using this to basically distress companies and asset strip them and sell their kind of assets at an enormous profit. And so what we, what we see to a certain extent is some of the extractive financial processes which had previously have been focused on international markets being applied um, here in the UK increasingly since 2008. And on that I'll also pass over to Ben.
in the UK, and especially in the UK, have been mainly working on this issue of global loans. So, yeah, Paul gave a great introduction already, these are all aware. Um, the, in, in a way, our, our, our cooperative research for action started from this very kind of um, citizen debt audit project, because we have been working together as an activist and campaigning with Debt Relief in the UK before, and, you know, in, yeah, in, in a way, this debt audit that I've been talking about is a collaboration of not just research fraction and the Reference UK, but also a lot of people um, all around the country who have been digging into their particular concerts accounts and, and, and launching objections that I'll be talking about in, in a bit more detail in a moment. But I definitely just want to emphasize right to start off with that yeah, this isn't necessarily our work, even though obviously to some extent it is, and we've put a lot of effort into it. And, um, yeah, I like actually, we've got a few copies. Uh, Peter, who is busy <laughs> with the little one right now, has them. Um, but yeah, you can definitely grab a copy of, of a report that we published last uh, October that details across a bit more, a bit more. But yeah, I just want to emphasise that this wouldn't have been a project if it wasn't for a lot of the people who have been taking action. And to start off with. What is the citizen debt body? The way we see it is that we wanted to, we, we, our, our working together actually goes back to the Occupy Movement 2011 as well. And after that, we kind of wanted to uh, keep working on the ways that finance and debt work to uphold uh, power in society and the current inequalities that there are and erode democracy. So we started working on this on, on this issue of debt. And kind of where we're coming from is that austerity, even though it's obviously most urgently felt through cuts in service itself and people in really difficult professions, it's actually much more than that. And when we speak about austerity, we also need to speak about financialization and we also need to speak about debt. And kind of that shift in power relations, that especially in local government right now in the UK, it's really visible in the way that um, councillors are making less and less of the actual decisions and sometimes backbench councillors actually even have very little access to information about what's going on in their council. Power is all within um, cabinets and directly elected mayors and more importantly, for the kind of, if we put on the lack of democracy, unelected officials that do a lot of big decisions as kind of administrative decisions within the logic of the market sort of enters and yeah, you need to do things like automatic <coughs> payments because that's just the way the world grows. <laughs> and there's no conversation to be had about that. Um, that repayments are also reinvented in council budgets, which is a big um, part of the kind of authority context in which we have been operating. Um, it's also really important to emphasize that we haven't come up with this idea of the citizen debt audit. It, we stand on the shoulders of a long tradition of, of movements, especially after the 1980s uh, debt crisis in the global south. There were um, yeah, a lot of citizen movements you know, demanding to uh, inspect the origins of the debt that they were finally, that they, they suddenly found themselves in a position where uh, their countries were demanding to pay debts that actually hadn't benefited the population so long. Um, so that's always um, this kind of important acknowledgement that I want to make, and also that there are different ways to do audits. Uh, an audit can be done by a government, like was done in Ecuador in 2007, 2008, or it can be done by the lender, um, like Norway has done. It can be done by, um, yeah, a kind of citizenry, uh, even though that's obviously then not an official one, and in a way, to produce the best results, you would want to aim towards um, yeah, having some kind of um, yeah, involvement from, from official institutions. 
But the, the idea is to determine what debt is illegal, unsustainable, illegitimate, and odious. And that's the next thing that I want to open up a little bit, this concept of illegitimate debt, because that's in, the, in a way in the heart of, of what we do. We, um, we borrow a lot of our kind of definitions of things from uh, the Spanish movement, uh, platform for a citizen debt audit, PACD, who, whose great um, quote and definition I've got up there. On, an audit is a process to collectively understand how we have arrived at the current situation, what economic, social, cultural, environmental, gender and political impacts has this indebtedness created. So they very much speak about an audit not just as a technical exercise, but as the process for the society collectively to understand what processes have bridged the debt and what is, in a way, reinforced by continuing to pay that debt. Um, there are a few points through which we have evaluated that, especially in um, Milan, where this report that we published last year focuses on. It's the contracting of the debt, the origin of the debt, and the servicing of the debt. And we can find several points um, about all these. I, yeah, but there's not really kind of one way to do a debt topic or one way to find illegitimate debt. I think that's the really message. Um, Paul really helpfully already opened this. Um, <coughs> Opened up a little bit what low goal on are. I'm going to try and not go into too much detail because when I do, I usually then realize that actually all my time um, was speaking itself. <laughs> I haven't managed to say all the other things that I wanted to say. Um, but even though our work has most recently focused specifically on zooming in on New York in East London, which is the most indebted borough in the UK. This is a problem that concerns at least 240 counties across the country um, that have been sold very aggressively, marketed through quite dubious advice and conflict of interest in the way that these loans were um, brokered. Have been sold these loans that, yeah, were basically the bank. Can change the interest rate at a pre agreed call period, like Paul was explaining. Uh, these are very long term loans. Uh, and then you kind of enter this territory where you have a 6 to 70 year contract where basically with every option for the bank to change the interest rate, you, know, you, you have a different risk uh, associated to all of those and all, all of those options. And actually one of the things that is quite important to say is that there's a lot of really, really <laughs> dodgy features about logos, but one of, one of the things that is maybe worth saying is that um, councils in the UK were actually forbidden um, to take out the River 6 between uh, 1991 and 2011. Um, so one of the things that it looks like to us is that logos, um, yeah, are maybe sort of then been a way to overcome that ban by embedding the derivative in the loan, so it actually just looks like a loan contract on the face of it. Um, but the, the well, one of the reasons why I like to emphasize this point is that it's also um, yeah, the reason why councils were prohibited uh, taking out derivatives was that actually in 1989, Hanson and Fulham Council in London nearly went bust speculating with interest rate swaps and through a lengthy court battle. Um, with Goldman Sachs, the um, uh, council actually got some of those loans written off. So it's also important to acknowledge that we're not just talking about this kind of dystopia and all would like to see this unjust loans cancelled. It is actually like debt cancellation is something that has happened throughout history and it can happen again and it is happening all the time. And actually, we or oh, maybe even getting there with logos because eight councils are now taking legal action against Barclays Bank on the basis of um, 
yeah, local owned interest being like the Viper and the bank having been involved in creating the rights at the same time. Neon concert is also taking action against RBS, and even more recently now in the news, we've seen that RBS is actually winding down its entire local owned portfolio and they are offering consoles. Basically, waiting the exit fee on the loans so that council can yeah, refinance their local loan portfolio with public works loan but central government issued loans, um, which is a really big, really big win because, as Joe was describing, RBS is very central to this this whole story of, of um, yeah, how uh, the financial sector is within power over society and bringing about this whole society that we have at the moment. Um, speaking of the authority narrative, this is a couple of years old now, but um, here's an illustration of why that is and can be very problematic. Basically, um, it shows the interest payments to banks compared to other spending by the council, and I'm not sure how clear that is to read, but the um, column banks, that is the one with the three different colors there, is bigger than environmental and regulatory services, public health and housing services. So, yeah, you can see that we are talking about something that is actually quite substantial, not just an important issue because Um, I'm not sure now, if I said in the beginning that repayments are also really fenced, so the, when, when cuts need to be made, it's not an option to cut this, um, this um, column that you see there with, with, with the interest payments to banks, and that's kind of yeah, one of the ways in which you can clearly see how debt is really central to the story of disciplining councils or other public actors to act in the interests of financial capital instead of in, in the interests of their residents. Um, in a way, I, I hope that I've mainly answered the question why resist debt already, um, but especially because the group that we were, we, we were originally involved in with is called Debt Resistance UK, I quite often I'm asked the question, what does resisting debt actually mean? What's debt resistance? Why is debt resistance important? And in the case of local loans and local government finance, maybe the most obvious example is that local government is in a really dire funding crisis, and the funding from central government has been cut by, um, on average, very nearly half, which means that for some councils it's 70 in, in their funding from central government, which means that they are really, really struggling to um, yeah, provide service to residents. New and where we've been working on the audit most concentratedly, um, the situation is really, it, 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 it's actually unbelievable. It's actually un absolutely unbelievable. The, the scale of the housing crisis is one in 24 residents are homeless, especially most of these people with police officers. I think they've grown since they were than street homeless, but still when you, for instance, speak to some of those people who are in, 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 in temporary housing, emergency accommodation, who you know, have small kids, live in just absolutely inadequate housing for those children to even you know, develop and, 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 and be safely, it's, um, yeah, you almost just would not believe that we are in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, um, what's also important to say is that when we look at the debt as the kind of driver of this increasing inequality that is now especially excavated through austerity cuts, it's, it's really important to not just talk about economic inequality because obviously there's a lot more to the inequality that debt is driving and there's a lot of um, um, yeah, kind of operational.
questions along the lines of uh, gender, race, disability, sexuality, etc., that are also accentuated by authority cuts and by the way that there is prioritizing the kind of interests of, of, of finance capital. My idea are probably not surprised if I tell you that some of the, um, yeah, the example that I just told you about people living in the population that is absolutely inadequate for them and their children in New York. That example comes from a workshop that we did with um, single mothers, mainly um, mainly black single mothers from migrant backgrounds, um, often with no recourse to public funds in really, really marginalized positions in society. Um, that, that's also one of the challenges we have when talking about resistance to, to debt and kind of re resisting debt in order to reduce democracy. There are, in a way, so much more acute crises that people are facing. For instance, when we've been reaching out to people in East London who are fighting their own fights, and especially fights around housing, are really um, obviously very sort of every day for people, and then it can be really difficult sometimes to relay why the bigger picture, or, or even if people understand, obviously, why the bigger picture would be important, it's, it's quite hard to then say quickly what could be done about that bigger picture, or what's its, um, yeah, what's, what's in a way the sort of usefulness of trying to change that bigger picture rather than <coughs> changing the very sort of material conditions that, that people are facing. Um, the way I think of it is that in a way resistance to austerity is also resistant to that because these issues are so intertwined and resistance to austerity is also resistance to financialization. Um, and maybe the note to end on is that because, as we heard this morning, and, and, and we probably all in this room realised that the uh, kind of austerity project, the uh, neoliberal financialisation, financialised neoliberalism, is very good at making these connections. Uh, so that's why we also need to be making those connections, and why, at least, I'm putting my energy into working on, on, on debt, even though. between so many brilliant scholars and thinkers, but um, I thought also after yesterday what could, or what could be my contribution today, and I, uh, first I wanted to talk maybe about one project, but I thought it would actually be nice to briefly go through a number of them and speak about um, the different maybe tactics I use in my work to kind of translate also my kind of research on finance to an audience, because as an artist I do have an audience, the audience is, it can be very different, and so the means of communicating can also be very different. Um, so we'll quickly go through some projects. I have like eight examples. Um, I hope I don't oversimplify, but we can always talk about it later. Um, yes. So maybe important to mention also that I think um, as someone, as an artist working in art and with poetry and imagination, 
uh, the fact that the finance has become so such an imaginative force as well is very problematic for me as an artist. Um, this is an example of a cat bond, for example, where a future natural disasters that have not happened yet are already traded on the market right now. And I think if you speak of imagination, this is definitely an example. Also something like um, a species swap derivative, where um, they're building a, a financial derivative on species going extinct or um, not, um, just as two examples. Um, then this is an early project that um, Paul already mentioned, um, but I think it's important to kind of, um, with these examples, maybe also tie abstract financial structures down to a kind of material reality and how you can experience and deal with it also as a kind of non-expert, which in a way I am. <laughs> um, as, as an artist in residence um, here in the financial district, Amsterdam School Zardos. And this is the place where I was for four months and I was supposed to do something with the community there. And I thought, okay, who is this community in between all these glass towers? Um, so I thought, okay, let's first find out who is my neighbors, who are my neighbors. It turns out these were my neighbors. <laughs> and um, BP is a kind of a short abbreviation for a company structure that uh, in the Netherlands is very popular. Um, but also most mailbox companies uh, adopt this kind of legal uh, uh, status, let's say. Um, these were also some neighbors. Um, you see these patterns in the name, these as well. Um, but then sometimes it became more and more abstract where they even adopt you know, military language and don't take the, 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 the oh, how do you say, the, they don't take even the effort. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the real name doesn't matter anymore. So I decided, um, I said, can you give me a list with all the companies here? And they said, no, and even if it's not there, if it would be there, we would not give it to you. I said, okay, I'll make it myself. Uh, but the list became a book because there were more than 37,000. Uh, so how it works is that each page is one address. So if there's an empty page with just one company, it's likely a real company with what they call real substance, real employees and office. Sometimes there's more than three and a half thousand companies on one roof. So that you know they're just uh, shell companies. And it, it, it used to be Goldman Sachs, Chicken Farms from Kazakhstan, with like the forces of companies. Okay, so this was a book. I graduated as a graphic designer, so at the time this kind of made this also uh, to an audience. Um, in the same area, I, I worked at the time also with a group of friends, basically, and we set up actually a bank. Uh, how that worked is that because of the crisis, there was this empty plot of land, and we negotiated with the local municipality for more than two years to give us this piece of land for an art project. Finally, they agreed, and so um, we wanted to start a bank, but we didn't have any money, we didn't want to ask for any government funding, so how did we start? We convinced someone who, <laughs> who had sea containers to give us a sea container as our office, and we called it the Art Reserve Bank, so Kunst is Art. So, um, I hope you can see it a bit. Um, this, this image is actually made by a banker next door who was working for the Avian Umbro Bank from his window, uh, because we wanted to kind of suggest this bank would be there, but we didn't have anything, so we just had this black uh, plastic, and we painted on it like there will be a bank here, this is the floor plan. Uh, and what the floor plan actually represents, the two circles. In, in the right side of them, that's our vault. And on the left circle, there would be a minting um, uh, machine uh, where we would mint coins. Um, so, yeah, this is a process of eight months where we in the weekend with volunteers from the neighborhood built, <laughs> built this bank and asked people for donations for materials. Um, and then finally, we kind of opened as a bank and um, yeah, we were minting coins every day. We would mint 20 coins that were designed by famous Dutch artists. And so the deal was that you could actually uh, get a, let's um, see, halfway. Did you scroll a little bit? Or is it this one? Yeah. Um, you could get a, a good artwork of a good artist for a relatively cheap price. Uh, so you would come to the, basically, uh, how would you call that? The look at. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you would give euros and you would receive this artwork back. Um, the idea was also that if after a certain amount of time you would want to get rid of the artwork, you could come back to us and you would get 15% interest. 
And the idea was, let's try if um, people value art more than money, because mm -hmm. it was very easy to make money with this kind of um, process. Um, then what happens, uh, oh yeah, maybe it looked like this from the top, but event is a bit like some sort of Guantanamo Bay or <laughs> stuff. Is this is from another bank, a photo made. Um, and also you see Avian Amro and where the dot, the arrow is on the right, that's where we are, our so we're uh, small. Um, but then suddenly we got this ladder from the Dutch Central Bank uh, with a fine of 2 million euros. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, there were six points that we were breaking the law, but um, yeah, how we dealt with that, I can talk about it later, but it's a story. Uh, Seven points. Yeah, <laughs> but we always ghost this, like, we forced out the ghost of power, because apparently we did something that the Dutch Central Bank had to stop it, which was kind of interesting. Um, okay, so by uh, use the loopholes in this area, but at the same time, I was also interested in why is the Netherlands so important for all these mailbox companies in this, in this area? So I kind of um, started to study the boring things, as was mentioned yesterday, the Dutch tax law, and I don't know anything about it, but uh, I spoke with a lot of different former tax lawyers, and then I thought, wouldn't it be great if we can invent something that people actually have to avoid as much tax as possible on behalf of a multinational? So uh, I was first trying to to understand how all these structures internationally work. So you have this, the double Irish Dutch sandwich, we know that you had a Cyprus sandwich, you had an Indian Mauritian sandwich, there were a lot of sandwiches uh, with jurisdictions and uh, channeling money back and forth. Um, and then I found that there was this database that tax lawyers used, that, but the subscription was something like 8,000 euros a month. Um, but it had a lot of tax rates of companies worldwide. So I felt like, oh, I need to get that data, but how do I do it? So usually sign up as a researcher, that works in my case. Um, and they gave me access for two hours, so I downloaded the whole database. <laughs> and then we developed this game called Texodus. It's still online if you want to see it, texodus.net. Um, maybe, yeah, the video doesn't work at this moment. Basically, you pick a multinational, um, you're thrown in the sort of world map, you have to learn all about tax treaties between countries, different type of companies. So you set up a structure and you see at the end uh, how much tax you avoided. Your route is uploaded to a public database, so everyone by playing kind of helps mapping out what potential routes are there. Um, what happened at the time was that a, du a Dutch investigative documentary uh, series on the public television, they they heard about the game and they said, we want to make a documentary about this too, let's do it together. And then we launch everything on um, public television uh, on the day that people have to hand in their tax files, on the 1st of May. So we did that. Um, and then what happened is that this is the back end of the game. I was following for weeks who was playing it, so you can see where people are from. Um, yeah, you could see quite a lot actually. And then I also saw, for example, that the Belgian government <laughs> was always playing on Tuesday morning. The Dutch government, something else happened there. This is a screenshot of the website. And members of parliament started asking questions to the state secretary of finance, minister of finance. And they refer specifically to the game in the documentary in the official documents. And there was this debate in Parliament about it. So this is all 2012, 2013, so a while ago. But yes, it, it kind of snowballed out. And then what happened, maybe this is quite funny, the, the Socialist Party started or organizing a tax free tour as well. They were very inspired, I think, by it. And they started organizing bus tours for citizens to the financial district to visit mailbox companies. <laughs> the ones that we did visit initially with the book. Uh, so there was a sort of interesting uh, circle. Um, then, yeah, this is sort of a little baby sister um, project where, yeah, as you said, uh, this is a website where you can find all opportunities worldwide to uh, obtain another citizenship or visa. So it's, it's, it's really about this idea of citizenship has become a financial product, not a right by birth, but something that you can obtain or lose um, uh, if you have the means or if you violate the yeah, law. Uh, so images, it's online also still. 
uh, or it's sometimes presented as an installation, so more like a sort of shop where you can buy all these citizenships. Oh yeah, sorry, and it looks, oh, this is an important aspect that also maps out how much refugees actually have to pay in order to be smuggled into Western countries. So it also looks into the black economy around citizenship, um, not only for the elite. Um, then this, yeah, I was mapping all these kind of financial flows and as a graphic designer uh, trained, um, you know, you, you start to think in those diagrams and maps, and that's how you imagine the world. But of course, then it becomes the question, what is, what is this dot on a map? What's the reality behind that? So um, I, started, uh, no, it's maybe, uh, I started visiting, actually, locations um, related to stock exchanges and trading. And um, this is an image, it looks like an abstract painting almost, but what you're looking at here is one millisecond of trading by mm -hmm. algorithms. We think maybe some sort of, I know, public imagine, collective imagination, that trading is done by people in trading pits that are shouting at each other, but more than 75% is done by algorithms. And it looks like this. But what's really important are these submarine cables um, for, um, this trading. And so um, since 2012, I visit, um, whenever I do another project, I have a bit of money, I buy a ticket or something, and I try to visit the point where these cables come on land. And what is important is that um, here you see some images Mauritius, uh, France, uh, Russia, uh, yeah, just, just to give you um, just a quick overview. Of course, you never see the cable. The cable is very deep in the ocean floor. But what for me it is about is of creating different images, different sort of ima visual imaginaries around what are what is trading, what are stock exchanges. It's not guys shouting in the pit of Wall Street. It's these landscapes that get stitched into this global infrastructure, uh, financial infrastructure. Also, it's about what kind of scars do you, does it leave in the landscape. So the image on the right, you see this beach with this sort of gap in it. Uh, this, this cable, this is a Mauritius. This was just only dug there like recently. So you still see the scars of digging in the landscape somehow. I was here for a while for a residency in, um, in the north, uh, northwest of Russia. And what I researched there, I will talk is a, this is a visualization of it. Um, because of the melting Arctic ice, um, it will be possible for the first time in history, it is expected in the next eight years, to put a submarine cable on the Arctic Ocean floor. This doesn't exist now because it's not possible because of the ice. Melting ice makes this possible. And why especially traders are so excited about this is because it will cut the trading time between London and Tokyo to 42 milliseconds which can mean millions in one month time. So less ice means more money in less time. So it's all about late latency and how fast data travels. Because now this data goes by the Pacific or the Middle East. Um, then what is really important to point out, these cables that I talk about, is, um, we think often of the cloud, but of course uh, more than, I think it's now still 96% of all our data goes through cables in the sea, so it has this really physical material reality. Uh, and this is, yeah, this is one of the recent maps of these cables, um, but it is very much uh, rooted in this map. Um, and it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but this map is a map um, basically of a huge project by the British Empire since the 1830s, which was called the All Red Line. And it was a way of connecting all its colonies um, through this new technology, the Telegraph Line. And the idea was not going through hostile territory, but basically um, go through, through the sea. So it was really about creating faster communication and control with its colonies. And so the routes that and the hubs that the internet follows today is actually st almost a, uh, like a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, how do you say, print of this uh, old map. Uh, here on the right side you see stems with all these sort of fragments with the sort of celebration of this universal network. Um, and then we get into another aspect, the reality of data, uh, number five. 
So <clears throat> these are some newspapers that I collect from, from antique shops in the, in the UK. And especially, I'm interested in how this new technology of the telegraph line and this laying of the cables worldwide and connecting its colonies, how that was kind of written about and presented to the general audience. So these are some newspapers from 1840s, 1850s, where they show, okay, these cables are made in factories in London, this is how the cables are built up. Um, and what's extremely important in that time is the discovery of a rubber um, plant in, in the Malay Peninsula, in the nation Malaysia, and this is called Prakaguta on the right side, because the rubber of this plant was the only natural rubber that was resistant against salty seawater. So this rubber became the outside layer of all these cables. Um, you can see an example. And so in a way you could say that this rubber plant and the rubber is the same as you know, the coton in our phones and devices right now. It becomes this main ingredient. And um, there's also a really beautiful paper written about, some, it's called something like a, a Victorian ecological disaster that describes that more than 100 million trees in, in uh, Indonesia were uh, basically killed for this, and, and six species went extinct, and um, yeah, so it's a really interesting uh, research. Um, at the time, I was in contact with the Dutch Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, which is basically the, the, yeah, the, the museum where our colonial history of the Netherlands uh, is present everywhere, and I wanted to see um, images of um, a Dutch rubber plantation that produced this rubber in um, Java, Indonesian island. And these are some of those images. So here you see on the left side, you see the plantation, the laboratory. Here you see women plucking leaves from the trees. Um, they were dried in the attic. Um, then they were grinded into the sort of dust here as well. Um, and then it was melted, basically, um, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and poured into these kind of shapes and shipped to London. Um, then something strange happened, and this one is not working, this is supposed to loop, but we have a PDF file. <laughs> um, what happened is that these reports popped up from beach bombing sites in Europe that people found these strange blocks on the beach in France, Ireland, also the UK, the Netherlands, and people are like, what are these blocks? They look like with a lot of seaweed on it. Um, and then something happened. I have this picture also from the museum. And I was like, it looks the same. You can't really see it here. Um, but as, as it turns out now, there was a ship on its way from Indonesia to London with all these blocks of Perkaputa in order to make cables with them. But the ship sank on its way. And this is early 1900. Um, probably the shipwreck disintegrated by now and all this cargo started floating up to the water and by now it also kind of washed on shore in Japan and um, uh, Caribbean as well. Um, uh, eventually I traced down, it was in contact with a lot of these people who found the block, I, I, I traced down three of these blocks also myself. Um, and I use them in exhibitions together with archival material and photos. Sometimes that's also a tactic that I use. Um, but I also want to quickly explain this little tube here on the right side, because this is a, a cast I made of the, the original object. And in this cast, there's this tube of, um, with a geographical coordinate that you can see here. Uh, these geographical coordinates um, is a way of not letting only these objects speak about this first, in a way, network, colonial network, or, but also about something that's about to come. And that has to do with this series of formulas that I really don't understand so well, but they are from a paper from two MIT researchers, um, and it's called Relative, Relativistic Statistical Arbitrage. And it's um, basically commissioned by um, financial actors asking them if they can calculate how, if stock, stock trading, how it can become even faster in the future. How much milliseconds faster it can get. And so but it, basically the thing that they um, calculate is like, okay, you have two stock exchanges, those two boxes on the right and left, but if you want to exactly exploit the price difference between them, you have to be in the middle of them. Um, 
And those middle points is what they call, um, in this map, this is just a translation I did, um, I can't see it really well, but they call it our treasure map. And so maybe, yeah, no, no, maybe you can see it here better. Basically, they've calculated that um, you have 68 stock exchanges worldwide, and all the white dots are places where data centers in the future have to be <laughs> built. Um, I think two-thirds of their calculations is at sea, so there are now even some examples where they're experimenting with floating data centers in order to make trading faster. Yes, it's quite depressing. <laughs> uh, quickly, uh, do you have them? Okay, um, yeah, maybe I, okay, maybe I skip through this one, sorry. Then I think something um, maybe good to also mention in a way of how finance in, in its kind of most contemporary form is always about trying to generate sort of information advantage. And in another project what I'm looking at is how hedge funds are using satellite footage in order to um, speculate on assets almost in real time. So maybe really important to point out that when we look at a satellite image like this, we think it's a photo from out of space. Uh, but that same photo has also this layer in it, or this layer. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of satellite image consists of many different layers, and in those layers they can actually measure different infrared uh, values. So why is that important and interesting? Um, is let's say each material in this room, uh, but also minerals, has what they call spectral signature, something you can um, yeah, look for through infrared uh, from outer space. And if you know the spectral signatures of minerals, uh, that means that on the left side you see what we think is a satellite image from a mine in Chile, but if you look through the different uh, infrared uh, values in it, what pops up in pink is actually silver. Or here, this is uh, an image from um, a salt mine in Tibet, uh, what pops up in, in purple is salt. This is uh, measuring crops in campus and, and basically monitor if they have a virus or not, if they're growing well or not. This, the, the red that pops up here is iron in Ukraine, so iron ore. Um, and this is all done through these really tiny satellites called cube satellites, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters relatively cheap to produce compared to the big ones. Um, and what they now can do even is have HD footage from outer space, um, video, live video footage, monitoring here is a gold mine in Turkey. And the little boxes that you see here and there, they basically measure the, um, how many trucks come by every day. This one is more astounding for me. I think uh, here they're monitoring oil reservoirs around the world over a month of four weeks time, and what they measure for through algorithmic analysis is if the shadow on the inside grows or becomes smaller. That means that the lid is higher or lower, which means there's less or more, more oil in the reserve. Um, so yeah, I think I have a few more examples, so I think I leave it at that. Oh yeah, maybe this last one. Uh, on the left side, satellites are calculating how much cars there are at, for example, companies like Walmart in order to predict how the sales are. On the right side, they're monitoring the shadows of buildings in China to kind of predict if the construction boom is slowing down or going up. Um, and maybe to say when, yeah, when these kind of technologies keep kind of growing and growing, the question is also like how can you yeah, you know, even me as an artist, but everyone, how, how can we follow that or understand it? So, um, yeah, that's maybe a question to uh, pose. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, I think even though you are methodologically, I guess, quite different, there's a lot of similarities between what both of you all three are doing in terms of investigation and representation. And I think um, 
Maybe it's the wrong way around to look at it. I, I like looking at both of all three of your work as something that can prompt uh, methodologies in my own academic work. But maybe you shouldn't see the academic work as necessarily the best endpoint. Um, so it's the wrong way around to look at it. But I think, you know, um, the other thing that connects your work, I think, is John and a few others mentioning that quote from Mackenzie about mundane political economy with a very specific meaning about fee structures rather than seeking profit. But in the more mundane meaning of mundane, um, looking at local council authority debt and looking at how the fact that council treasury officials might not be advising properly or might be making decisions under duress and the consequences that has for black single mothers in the standard who end up homeless is something that private scholars don't do enough. I think that level of profoundly important, particularly in the UK, I think we see local authorities as really mundane and not really worthy of attention, and so much of our lives is funneled through local authority decision making, and we should pay more attention to it. And I think, um, Becca as well, this uh, looking at there's a switch from the mundane to the spectacular and back again over and over in your work because you're looking at this these cables, right, that we don't see that have to be there, that underpin this interconnectedness that most of us are kind of comfortable accepting is there but don't really think about how it's landed and definitely don't think about uh, what goes into making it possible, what went into making it possible from sorry, from the uh, rubber petrogator of rubber plantations of the Victorian ecocide to today, this, uh, the kind of plans for floating data centers. <laughs> that is, you know, again, about increasing trading times that will be experienced by traders as profoundly mundane, <laughs> even though that architecture is going to require a huge mobilization of resources, claims on territory that will just happen. Right, um, and so I think it's I think it's really important how you bring those into um, into into kind of one frame. I'm struggling to concentrate because I'm still not quite over species swap derivatives. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, something that again drawing out what happened across the presentations, looking at this layering of. Um, Layering of colonial past and present, uh, of financial presence from the the all red line, the telegraph line, and the sort of almost exact echoing of that. And, and just thinking about how that emerged, so you didn't have to go through sort of enemy territory, and now the same the, the same loops are integrating people into uh, high frequency trading. Um, and then you have this echoing of austerity and the RBS bailout in the equivalents of the bailout after Panama and Darien. Um, and again, I'm not quite sure what to do with those echoes, because like I was saying at the start, I think you can kind of observe that there's a colonial echo, but then what part of that matters to the story you want to tell today about homelessness in you. Um, and the final thing I want to say, there's so much I want to say, the final thing I will say, um, but you, you, you said you almost wouldn't believe that we're in one of the richest countries in the world. And I think that this just reminded me of something that um, maybe uh, needs more attention in how we think about colonialism, coloniality, and finance. And that, well, you know, how relevant is it that you're in one of the richest countries in the world if you have one in 24 people in an enormous city? being homeless, right? That clearly is not an interesting fact anymore. Um, so while it's obvious that we have to pay attention to the kind of sedimented racial and colonial histories that, for instance, seem to make it mostly um, black women, uh, children of migrants who end up homeless as a result of austerity, um, there's, we also need that kind of the target of our anti-colonial critique to not be out of time, right? That the, the, the colonial map that is the problem 
might have shifted somewhat, and I think that needs to be taken into account somehow. I'm going to stop talking. Who else wants to talk? <laughs> Taxidus, when things sort of get their own life and are picked up by different communities, I think that's great, but that's something you always maybe try, but you never know if it's going to happen. With the game, like with Taxidus, I think because it was made as something that doesn't, it's made from a critique, but it doesn't say tax avoidance is bad. It's more like you do it and then you decide. So that meant that a lot of different groups, but also tax lawyers or uh, professors in tax law, they they play it, or still I get these emails like, oh, can you update this rate because I'm talking with students about the uh, ethical sides, but we want to play it, but it's not up to date. So that is kind of interesting, and it's more like you can create sort of a platform where the discussion can be. Um, at the same time, for example, this whole research, um, I'm just showing you my research that there is no work with it yet, because. Um, yeah, to kind of understand these things and how they exactly work, that also needs some really focused time and where I work alone and then, yeah, after a while I find a way to put it out again. Um, but, so I always kind of flicker between these very public, like, participatory projects and at the same time going into this in-depth research and, I mean, this is a really difficult one because, you know, the images that you see are also quite beautiful and aesthetic. But that's not the kind of point you want to make. So it's like, um, yeah, it, there's always, how do you say, like, it's a curse, you know, also. In a way, it's good to find representations or images, but it's also a curse at the same time. So, um, yeah. Um, so, I think that's the second kind of question you just touched on. A lot of the images seem to be um, a cognitive response. At least we've been able to understand further these. Yeah, I think, um, like, for example, at the moment I'm quite interested, like, I just did this research about catastrophe bonds, you know, that speculate on future disasters. Um, but then I kind of wrote what people call a theatre play, where, where there's basically the setting is that there's this billionaire bunker. And in the billionaire bunker, there's uh, three species, three uh, models of animals that are extinct. And they're discussing the last man, which is us, who is, who is speculating on cat bones. So this is another way of engaging an audience in, uh, with some sort of um, understanding of what these really complex bonds are, but also to think how it relates to life and death and extinction and things like that. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's always a bit of a struggle trying to find what is the best way. So I think, yeah, I kind of never really have a clear idea when I begin. I just, it's really research by doing. So if you have any, <laughs> I would be curious to hear your thoughts later on. Please. Yeah. Great. Um, amazing. Uh, I have two things. Uh, uh, one is uh, building data centers. So I was at NICE uh, last year in LA and uh, there was a Maori team there um, that are part of Batemana Roranga, which is a, a Maori data sovereignty group. And they're actually using, the, they're working on data sovereignty, but they're also thinking about where it's held. And so they were thinking about earthquakes in Aotearoa. And so they were like, we're actually making like these like sea containers to hold these that could move depending on disaster, right? So. That was kind of an interesting, you know, the data center is floating, I'm thinking about another way mm -hmm. this idea could, is actually around a sovereignty or thinking through the future, or not just a future, but a knowing of earthquakes. My question is around the, and shares around the, the uh, GIS stuff, so, uh, and speculation. So, 
um, a couple of years ago, I was really interested in GIS, and I like went for it around um, urban heating, etc. But I also was in Jamaica where hurricanes, because of heat, are getting more intense, right? So we're dealing with more hurricanes more frequently than our mango trees can cope with. Um, mango trees are interesting. I usually have to big hurricane. Uh, the strongest trees produce an amazing mango season the next year or so, but now with too many of them at one time. But I was, I'm part of the um, GIS hurricane um, uh, response team in Jamaica, and so we did um, GIS. And so um, what's interesting for me is because there's actually an insurance group out there that handles speculation around hurricanes that we, we on the ground with a hurricane would would enter coordinates around what's happened, then that's loaded up and it's directly attached to if we get paid out on this insurance around hurricanes. So I just um, wanted to, to just mention that to you around how that opening around um, is actually tied to other things. So my question is to you is how deep does this drill down? Because I'm thinking about it in Jamaica where you might have a small house but it holds many people. And so when you have the spectral analysis, um, that kind of says, this is just like what constitutes a, a house and how many people would be in it. That could mean that for all of what we're documenting on the ground, these cats are viewing on the top and then making other decisions about how the payment would look, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just interested in how how far can it drill down, like, mm -hmm. like in terms of people, you said trucks, but I'm also interested in movement and what square footage can it drill mm -hmm. down to think that through with how they would match what was before the hurricane. And yeah. yeah, I took one slide off, but there's this comparison of, uh, it basically has to do with uh, resolution and HD. And by now they can actually uh, count a group, or just a flock of seagulls by, by the birds. Um, and um, so that is something I think it's very, the, 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 let's say the algorithmic, um, yeah, the software analysis is very detailed. I think what is more, what I don't, I mean, I don't have a really clear idea how, how deep they, for example, can look in the ground. You know, it's not really deep, but it's also not only the surface, because I think that is also an interesting question that you can actually see through the surface of the earth to see what's underneath that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some, um, you have maybe like six companies. One is called Orbital Insight, the other is called Terra Bella, and they are kind of the ones that, you know, they produce the satellite imagery on the one hand for the World Bank, but they also sell it to uh, hedge funds, um, you know, and they are the kind of neutral intermediary, but of course, uh, the fact that you monitor certain areas and others not, like what is in the frame, what is not, that is already a decision, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have you and Ben, sorry, and then John. I just quickly want to say something that came to mind, and there might be something wrong with me that I won't hear. But I was just wondering if people hedged cat bonds with mango features. <laughs> 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 Do you want me to take John and Max's question as well, while you think? Because you're both writing, so John, do you want to take um, So yeah, I have, I have a specific question and then a bigger comment that we can discuss. So the specific question I'll bite. Um, I'm curious uh, what, how, how do you resolve things with the central, central bank? How do you interact with that? Of course. And then the bigger question, I think this sort of piggybacks up what I caught in the comments. Um, the, the, the you guys are doing on the sort of activist side of things, right? 
is, and I, I feel like it's something that we haven't really discussed in much detail so far, is, and certainly how I approach it, right, is that finance and empire are interrelated, interdependent things, or even if they don't always work in tandem, they tend to work together for the same goals. And I think there really is um, a, a, a disjoint in the, the critique, right, of a, a left critique of finance that wants to dismantle finance and get back to some Social welfare state, when you know the origins of the social welfare state are deeply colonial and imperial, um, and the reason the social welfare state was dismantled in the first place and we moved toward the financial system was when you know all of a sudden uh, people of color, people from the empire, started turning to, to colonial centers, and there there seems to be that's, that's a fundamental sort of rift right in where our sort of where we form our, our critiques on the academic side and how we sort of act on those. In the We need to grapple with. Uh, you know, it's, 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 yeah, and that's something I struggle with all the time. So I think that's, that was something we tried to write about in the other society thing as well. When we first went to school, we talked about Max. You had a question. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the way that the um, the audit uh, and the, the process of visualizing that what is hidden or the auditing of what has been uh, obfuscated. The, the thing it draws our mind to is, uh, is that this would be uh, a resource for a certain democratic process. That if we knew, um, and if we could understand, then we would act. Um, and then if us, a public, so to speak, had this knowledge, then it would be empowered to do something. And I, I think there's a fair amount of skepticism now towards that, that process, that direct process. That, in fact, at, at a certain point, it sometimes feels like we have too much information. Uh, and second of all, uh, we've seen that people given information, even when they act, often power doesn't respond the way that we hope that they respond. Okay. So, setting that aside for just one second, I, I want to bring into the conversation an interesting book, especially when we're talking about visual uh, and visualizing things, which is uh, Nick Merzweb's uh, The Right to Look. And to make a very long story short, he takes the, the kind of quintessential moment when the colonized return the gaze of the colonizer and say, you don't have the right to look at us and, and, and uh, map us and organize us. We will look back. And the, the pathological fear that colonialism has always had at that precise moment of the return to gaze. And he explores this in a number of interesting ways. But one of the things that he, he sort of comes to the conclusion of the book is that this looking back is not just about seeing the colonizer and seeing the powerful as they are. It's also in the act of looking together we transform ourselves into a new political constituency. We give ourselves a new sort of um, appearance together that, that is outside of the visual field of the power. So I think about this in terms of these new technologies of satellite imaging technologies, which are part of this broader financialized framework by which the entire world is seen by the, you know, the eye of Sauron, the, the, the gaze from the, from the tower uh, of the speculator. And I wonder if, in both of the procedures that you guys are outlining, there's a way that it isn't just about providing and furnishing uh, more information for a democratic process that may no longer be what we thought it once was, but actually about bringing together new communities and new forms of collective empowerment. And what those might look like, what we might look like uh, as we transform into whatever we will need to become to overcome our present situation. Thank you. Should we just go the line? Okay. Maybe to start with this last, um, I think also like a lot of in the last years the, 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 the idea of visualizing and mapping things has been very really strongly at the core in order to understand things. But I think also um, I'm myself quite um, <coughs> pessimistic about its potential. Uh, also because um, in 2015 I was approached by the two Dutch investigative journalists and uh, yeah, I told the story yesterday. And they asked me to sign a non-disclosure agreement and I was like, well, not really. <laughs> uh, but uh, we talked for three weeks and then I did it anyway and then uh, they said, well, we're going to publish this big project internationally worldwide in uh, eight, nine months, which turned out to be the Panama Papers. And we need someone that can think of how to visualize this and go through that in another way. So I worked with them and then, of 
course you get really depressed afterwards because you realize, yeah, how many leaks do we need? How many visualizations do we need? You know, we, we can see already so much, nothing will change. Um, one thing that is very um, strongly present in my work in the last uh, years is also, for example, the Lithium Project you talked about. Um, I'm with a group of other artists, I briefly mentioned yesterday, but I will do it. Um, um, and basically we're looking at the mining of lithium, the projected mining of lithium in Congo, uh, from the beginning of extraction to the trading on the global stock exchange, uh, a London metal exchange, <coughs> to how it's pr processed into batteries for Tesla cars. And the thing is, we are a group of friends uh, in Italy, uh, uh, and we're artists from Netherlands, Belgium, Congo, Cameroon, uh, Australia. So friends is what binds us together in the first place, and each of us has our own specialty, our own context of making work. But the idea is to team up together and look at the whole spectrum together. Um, many of the artists in Congo who live there on the ground by the mines, they, they, they completely don't have any hope. They say like, you know, if you somehow want to survive, you have to work in this mining industry. So it's really hard to produce some sort of hope. But it's also by working together, we kind of develop a new way of sort of being together. You know, we go there, they go here. So it, it's also, even though it's not so much about what can we see or visualize or know, it's a, a different way of being together. And I think that's maybe already a starting point. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes uh, so, pick up the point on the on the welfare state. Um, so, I'll just, I guess, address this in relation to our work focusing on low values in town councils. So, I think speaking personally, one of the, the reasons I was motivated to, to start this campaign back in 2013-14 um, was basically seeing this kind of rhetoric around austerity and seeing, in particular, kind of where that was being focused. So. What became obvious to me as someone had previously worked in both local and state government was that for whatever reason town councils have been singled out for the, the highest proportion of the cuts that were coming down from central government to pay for the bank bailouts. And I kind of immediately saw there was going to be some very severe, perverse ramifications for particularly kind of the poorest in society who relied upon local councils, everything from emergency funding to housing to, um, you know, so the social care services, education, and so that was all happening basically without any really dem democratic conversation at all, just about, well, there's been a bank crisis with the bailouts and banks, we're this much money, we're just going to essentially kind of withdraw the state. And it was, there wasn't a debate, it was just, we're doing it. Uh, and so, I guess, yeah, I wanted to understand a bit more about the kind of, um, just basically, yeah, look, look behind um, what, else, what else was kind of going on within, um, local authority public sector organisations at the time, you start to find some interesting things. So for an example, the um, obviously there's been this kind of you know, decades long process of um, outsourcing and financialisation. And so for, for example, one of the, the, well, the first outsourcing company really in the UK, um, Capita, that was actually formed out of the Charter Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, which Paul mentioned during the introduction, now SIP for basically set auditing and accounting policy for local councils. So it was like auditors and financiers who were kind of working with these authorities knew from the inside kind of how they functioned and where the profitable chunks were. They were like, okay, let's set up a, a private enterprise, an outsourcing company to start outsourcing everything from you know council waste services to IT, um, finance departments, now they're into kind of planning, basically running kind of whole councils. And so, I mean, I think... Yeah, I mean, obviously we kind of need to be um, yeah, aware of the kind of the roots of kind of where the wealthy state came from. And I think you know there's a lot of scholarly evidence that you know, particularly in the UK, the wealthy state wouldn't have been possible without um, you know continuing reliance on the empire, particularly in India. And so we obviously yeah we should absolutely be thinking about these things in terms of not fetishizing what the wealthy state was and is. But I also think it's it's important to recognise that without a safety net for the for the poorest in society. We're going to see some, you know, terrible social consequences which we're already seeing, and all the indicators show that where we're heading, things are going to get much worse. So I guess our sort of campaign was like hopefully trying to draw some attention to where money was being extracted by the financial sector and trying to point the finger of the blame back where it should have gone, 
um, not instead of you know, doctors and nurses and teachers that were being paid too much, but uh, people who set up these financialization schemes to extract wealth from the state and from the citizenry. Um, so that was, I guess, some of the thinking behind, behind the campaign. I'll let Fanny talk about the objectives and what you wanted to achieve. Um, yeah, there's so many questions that um, points raised that I want to get back to that. I'm going to try and somehow navigate around the multiple arrows in my notes. Um, I think I'm going to start with um, this kind of mundane political economy. And one of the things that makes local government finance interesting for me is that um, it's, it's kind of very much at the sort of intersection of like really mundane and boring and something that's considered like absolute rocket finance. Like, you know, when you say to people you work in local government finance, the reactions sort of vary from like, <laughs> to like, oh wow, you know, I'm just asking really complicated stuff. And that's one of the things that makes it really interesting for me. And it's the kind of, yeah, I think quite, quite, quite telling about that sort of, yeah, way in which it is really important to try and make visible, um, yeah, some of this um, dynamics. Dynamics, yeah, and it was actually like super interesting to listen to your presentation. Okay, because so, like, Likewise. Um, there's obviously we're working completely different things, but there's so much overlap in terms of like kind of how we try to make some of these things understandable for people and. And, and kind of looking for sort of visualizations and, and almost kind of metaphors for things and sort of ways in into this kind of like complicated sort of, sort of structure of global finance. Um, because in a way, one of the ways in which I usually kind of describe what a citizen body is that it's making power visible and it's, it's kind of, yeah, making visible that there are choices that we can make, which in a way then comes back to your question before about this, like, is it relevant that we're in one of the richest countries in the whole world if people are living in, in, in conditions that nobody should be living in, um, in you know, one of the capitals of you know, global finance and the sort of, you know, London where there's so much wealth going through it. And the relevance of that for me, in a way, is that it makes us think of well, and the way things are distributed, and kind of makes it so clear and visible that none of the way in which power is distributed in the world and resources are distributed are anyhow kind of inevitable or natural or apolitical. And that's maybe one of the sort of main drivers of this um, work for me. But then there was yeah, the question from or comment from Max that I wanted to also get back to about yeah, I totally totally see the limitations of the kind of way of thinking of like oh, we just need to expose this and people will rise up because yeah, then I'm kind of paper is a great example of like there's a leak under leak, there's scandal after scandal, everybody knows that you know political systems corrupt and and you know, finance terrible and like people's interests, but still people aren't doing much. And I think that's a really important point for kind of citizen audits to go beyond that sort of demand for increased transparency. And there's actually a really interesting, um, I was read a really interesting article. I probably should have realized I'm coming to like an academic conference and looked up the author, so I could reference it. Um, that was about citizen audits in other contexts such as like COP um, watching in the US. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways it was talking about kind of difference between um, asking for transparency and sort of taking the power to you know, get information yourself was the difference between you know, police wearing body cameras mm -hmm. and still having access to that information. You know, a body camera can just like you know, not wear at some time, you know, the police can be like, you know, magic. But once you introduce, you know, crowds of people with smartphones, then that goes a lot further in the way that you, know, you actually have 
access to that data and continue to yeah, a lot better than we do. Hold the power accountable, which is basically what audits are about. So yeah, it's definitely um, yeah, not just about kind of yeah, using sort of yeah, kind of crunch up here to that sort of like, oh like let's just show people that you know there's something wrong. It's also about creating kind of new ways of um, yeah, even just using existing tools. I kind of realised actually I didn't go very much at all into the sort of tools that we've been using when I was talking about this. Um, but one of um, the sort of yeah, important ways for us to both campaign on the issue of local loans and to get information about them has been a bit of legislation called the Local Audit and Accountability Act, which um, basically, I'll be super brief, enables um, anybody to inspect council's accounts um, and residents to object to spending that they don't, don't think is in the public interest. And it's been really important in terms of like getting information and getting this issue into the sort of public um, conversation. There's been some really good legal response media coverage, for instance, in supporting people with ob objections. But it's really kind of exposed the limitations of the current um, democratic processes. And in a way, I do think that in order to kind of build new democratic processes and sort of create those kind of new alliances where for democracy and maybe sort of referring to, it's also yeah useful to kind of explore the limitations of you know democracy as it's sort of currently arranged and then through sort of hacking into those structures you can sort of take what is useful about them um, but then also Just a couple of concrete <clears throat> points to add on objectives. So um, we put out a bit of analysis end of last year, which was covered by The Guardian, basically showed that over the next 30 to 40 years, if councils don't refinance these low bow loans, uh, the taxpayer's gonna lose out over that period to the tune of about 16 billion pounds. Um, thankfully, some of them have started to move, so we've had, um, Looks like probably about 15 or 20 councils so far um, can cancel existing local loan debt, refinance it either using cash reserves or borrowing from central government. Um, we've seen basically Barclays um, cancel their option to increase interest rates on about £6 billion pounds of debt to councils, and RBS moved to cancel about £1.5 billion pounds of um, RBS loans to local authorities. There has been some movement. Um, Fanny mentioned the legal cases. What hasn't happened yet, which I think alludes to some of the conversation this morning, was understanding how these loans actually entered into in the first place. So one of the things I've focused on is the role of middlemen financial advisors. And so 
local councils have what's known as treasury management advisors. These are kind of bespoke financial firms that give advice to public bodies and we found out, again using investigative methods, that they were making about £40,000, £30,000 of profit um, on commission for each um, loan contract the council was entering into. Um, there were thousands of these contracts signed. Um, in addition to being paid by the council, the, um, the brokers and advisors were also being paid by the banks, so they paid on both sides of the transaction. And so there's obviously no way you can give council objective advice and entry into contract if you're being paid by both sides of that particular deal. So, I mean, we would hope that eventually there'd be some action taken against um, the advisors and middlemen. That hasn't happened to date. Um, part of the reason why because there are particular laws which say after about six years it's difficult to bring legal action unless we've got a fraud committed. So there are a series of kind of regulatory and legal barriers which prevent um, action being taken, part of which is because as local citizens we basically can't force our council to take litigation. They've got to do it of their own volition and to date very few councils are willing to, to take on the financial sector. So I think one of the, the, the bigger aims is to basically just highlight the extent to which through financialisation, the public bodies are often case no longer acting in the interests of local residents, they're interact, acting in the interests of the financial sector. And I guess we see this campaign as a way of trying to challenge that and trying to change it and make public bodies more accountable to the kind of, you know, the, the citizens are supposed to be serving. Thank you very much, John. Um, you have your hand up. I think that there's somebody else that had that hand up. Good point. Do you think? I still want to know about the central bank. <laughs> Can we take these questions off? Because that might be the last one. I think we're slightly. Did I miss someone? Yeah, just check if you missed anyone. Do, do you want to. Sure, I've got ask a question to make sure that we can get to. Sorry, John. It is a question that ties to what Max, kind of in my mind, it mixes with what Max and John were saying about um, kind of the, the gaze or like what happens when colonials show up and then suddenly you know, everything shuts down. So I'm kind of interested in, um, how are you all dealing with the kind of, I'm gonna put some topics, some things there, the moral project, like social welfare as a moral project, right? But then it's based on colonial gains, right? So when you say, you know, we're the richest, so why is this happening? I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about why that, Right, why, as John said, this shutdown happens when brown folks start to murder the content. After 62, that says we don't want any more people here. Even this business in Brexit, right, where the whole thing is about too many foreigners. And who engaged in that, which included people of color, or just like got caught in that? Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of interested in how you work, you work that. Um, yeah, thinking about. Scandinavian places where there seems to, there's like a different way you can look at the community invest or like challenges or puts people in jail or how they do their investing. So are there any models that we have for like getting ourselves out of how wealth is, is created in, in order to have these social welfare but we can feel okay about it in some way, shape, or form? Well, you guys think so much. Should we get to that? Because yeah. she did wrong. What? Uh, John was still wondering if you could give a oh, okay. brief account of why you got yes. in trouble. Um, <laughs> yeah. Physical disobedience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, they kind of sued us on six points. Um, one was the, the easiest one to, one was the fact that we used the word bank, but then we argued, well, uh, you also have a seed bank, blood bank, and <laughs> 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 bank. But, uh, the point that they were really kind of triggered by is that they say you're, you're providing financial service by giving 15% interest on people who bring them, and you don't have any license for that. So um, they basically summoned us to come to their, to their office, but it's a very highly secured building, and in order to uh, enter, you always have to bring your passport. Uh, so the five of us. Uh, by coincidence, for three months our passports weren't even made of us. Mine was lost or something. Someone else's was broken. So we kind of tried to stretch through all these excuses at the time. And then they said, now you really have to come. We're like, you cannot come. You come here. So 
two members of the Dutch Central Bank came to our bank. <laughs> <laughs> then we um, negotiated basically there that um, if we would um, uh, use the word art in some of the promotional material more often. <laughs> and um, yeah, so there were a few of these things and then they would kind of like blink an eye and that's in a way how we, yeah. That's yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe I also, one thing I was thinking, I would like to say about this visualizing, I think, um, um, two things I want to say. One is that I think, by visualizing, I don't think it's not about raising awareness anymore, you know, because I think that's also putting the burden on people like you have to solve this whole yeah. thing with the self. So for me, it's more about identifying how complex finance has become and where the level of intervention is, which is really with these two or six uh, companies that actually are having those satellites and produce. So it's also trying to understand where is actually the way you know, where, where um, how do you say, intervention needs to take place. And it's, yeah, so it's not about, oh, we visualize this and create awareness, but it's more about understanding the gap and, and um, on what level that is, in a way. Maybe that also links to the, the, the amateur uh, versus uh, expert uh, or technical. Uh, it's like, I think there's a lot of information that you can actually find as a... Just as a, let's say, amateur researcher, I think the only difficulty gets once you know and you want to intervene in some things, you know, maybe you need to work with satellite developers in order to hack something. That becomes a whole different story. But I would say there's a lot of things you can find if you have the time for it, which artists do, in a way. <laughs> um, and then, oh yeah, maybe about the last point. I mean, I don't know if I'm, I can, say something really smart about it but the thing I would like to maybe say that a lot of my work is also about saying to people in the Netherlands my fellow citizens that their illusion of stability is built on the backs and historical robbing of the rest of the world and if that the euros that they have in their bank account is not stability but it's that from someone else and it's more about how constantly the striving, striving for stability and security, can we replace it actually by accepting that it's super fragile and unstable, you know, and it's for the rest of the world has always been like that. So I think that is my kind of, in a way, project with that. Yeah, I don't know if that... So I guess, yeah, on the, on the kind of welfare as a global project, I mean, I guess I'd, I'd like to kind of unpack, unpack that a little and kind of um, particularly distinguish between um, social welfare as something which is driven by you know, central government bureaucracy and something which is kind of like delivered by local actors which are kind of more accountable to, to local democracy. So... Unfortunately, in the UK, we have the most centralised form of government effectively in the world. So, local government does have very few powers over kind of uh, what is done locally, what's spent and not spent. It's largely kind of dictated from the centre. Uh, so, speaking from a kind of personal view, I think if, if you're going to have um, uh, you know, an economy and a, a local state that serves people, that needs to be challenged. And so, um, I just distinguish a little between. Um, local government services where people are in close contact with and um, you know, perhaps local elected members are more accountable to constituents with the kind of like big centralised bureaucracies where a lot of us feel somewhat detached, don't have any access to power and can't really influence things. Um, and just one really crucial point in that, in that link, so um, local government's um, council tax debt at the moment is currently the one type of debt in the UK for which non-payment puts you in jail. And this is becoming a huge issue um, as central government funding to councils is cut. And that means that for those local councils, the proportion they're spending on services is going down, but the proportion they're paying on these existing debts is actually going up. So you're paying more for less services, and if you don't pay it, you end up in jail. Um, so I think one of the key things we're trying to do here again is just highlight the complete illegitimacy of some of these financial contracts that are being... Um, repaid here 
and try to use that as a, a vehicle to challenge the legitimacy of people in these, particularly poor people in these communities, being jailed for non-payment non of things like council tax. Um, and so, yeah, I, mean, I think there is obviously a huge project, particularly um, in the UK, to talk about um, you know, sort of empire and colonialisation and how that relates to things like the welfare state. Um, interesting, I think, in that Brexit is starting to kind of, you know, scratch at the surface some of that, and there are more conversations that are happening. Um, myself, coming from New Zealand, I think it's a conversation people are somewhat more used to having, partially because of the kind of treaty of the process. Um, but it's, a, I think, a conversation which is, you know, very much in its infancy here. And, you know, despite the best efforts of people like Akala on television, kind of speaks and these home truths, I think there's obviously a, a very, very long way to go. Um, Fanny. Yeah, I'm going to be really quite brief because basically I'm just going to maybe say that I haven't, like, I haven't really got an um, answer to that question um, about the yeah, welfare state and what the uh, sort of, yeah, what a model would be that we can base on extraction. I guess I find it important to say that I'm by saying that the UK is a working country in you know, financial terms and therefore that you know, richness should be distributed in a more equal way, I'm, I don't want to legitimise that world, that noble world that it comes from um, yeah, centuries and centuries of, of massive injustices. Um, <coughs> what I'm saying is that those injustices shouldn't be replicated in how the world is distributed today, but they currently are. I'm actually from Finland originally, so it, yeah, I've been on a massive journey, kind of, with my own thinking about the world that stays um, for several years now, and I have got nowhere near the kind of end of, of, of that journey, or kind of finding, um, yeah, a way to, yeah, think about welfare states in a way that would be not exclusionary and not. Yeah, a sort of national disgrace project to some extent, even if, like, obviously, I can, you know, I have a national country where the welfare state is actually quite functioning and, you know, a lot more benign than here, but then it also leads people to think about the state and the nation state as something really benign and that is hugely, hugely problematic. And I guess the main thing that I can really say is that, yeah, we need to go thinking beyond the nation state. I'm kind of thinking, and in a way, that's also partly why I really enjoy working on this local authority level, because then we can start looking into political entities that are actually much closer to people than the state, and where power can be built in a way that's alternative to the kind of nation state level. And I've actually just spent the last two days in a conference on municipalism, which is like super exciting. Um, so, yeah. Topic again. I think, uh, yeah, I think that question is going to keep coming up more. And, and mm -hmm. recalling what Rebecca was talking about yesterday with, with tax uh, and trying to put some of these things together. The Centre for Investigative Journalism is suggesting that the panel papers has helped to initiate $1.2 billion worth of claims from those national exchanges which may be suggested in making visible is productive of something, even if it's not about, oh, well, make them all aware and then the uprising will come. But again, we're back to what we were talking about yesterday. Rebecca was mentioning David Clinton's work on this type of chains of exploitation, where returning the avoided tax to the sort of metropole when that avoided tax is the result of extractive processes is, is a very curious kind of justice. And yeah, I don't know that there is a Coherence, kind of. That's why we're here, right? Yeah, yeah like exactly. internationalist, progressive. Well, I just wanted to say something there as well, Paul, in terms of the, 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 this network of media or houses that came together to work on the Panama Papers. They have appeared in various forms to talk about what it has actually mm -hmm. contributed going forward. And one of the things is to give them a structure that will allow them the freedom to do this kind of investigative journalism mm -hmm. in the future. Through these uh, collective NDAs that you were talking about, through the various sorts of legal structures, because what was happening in the past was that one newspaper or one television station would try and do this kind of investigative journalism and then get shut down. 
So no, in, in, in a way, this setup is sort of a very loose network. So no one jurisdiction could come down on them and shut them down. So I think there are other sorts of benefits that we, we need to bear in mind as well that don't seem immediately about finance, but are actually are part of yeah. democracy, which is necessary as well. Like divesting from competitiveness, yeah. so working collectively yeah. as media yes. houses to make sure exactly. nobody could be hit. It, yeah. My question yeah. is about di thinking through divestment, but that's what yeah. we're all yeah. Yeah. It's maybe about. also an right. interesting footnote um, to know that um, basically the journalists developed with the Panama Papers some sort of internal Facebook, yes, which is. which was about okay if someone in Mexico finds something about the Netherlands or Germany, yeah. you just send it through and and. This structure, this infrastructure, where all these journalists could share things, I, I think that's already a really big step. Yes, yes. And that's so that's unprecedented and continuous. So they've taken that forward.